These are the four people who were known to have rejected Islam, uh, rejected sorry, Jahiliyyah before the coming of Islam. And these four, two of them were from the tribe of Banu Asad, i.e. the immediate family of Khadija. So it's no surprise that Khadija is coming from a very open-minded, very inquisitive tribe. And she is of the first, in fact, the very first person to accept Islam, as we know. Khadija had been married twice before in the days of Jahiliyyah. Uh, and both of her husbands had uh, died. According to one report, one of them died and one of them divorced her. According to another report, both of them died. The first husband of hers was Abu Hind. Abu Hind. And this marriage resulted in uh, two sons, Hind and Hala. And the second marriage was to Atiq ibn Abid al-Makhzumi. And this did not lead to any children. So Khadija had two boys, two sons, Hind and Hala. Even though Hala uh, in our time is primarily a girl's name, but Hala was also a boy's name in that time. And so Hind and Hala uh, were both sons of Khadija. It is also rumored that she had other children uh, from the second husband, but the people have differed about that. We don't have any reference of them. So most likely she only had two of, uh, of the sons. And the most famous of them is Hind. Hind accepted Islam along with his mother Khadija. We don't know much about Hala. Uh, whether he accepted Islam or not. Hind accepted Islam along with his mother and he died a shaheed in one of the battles after uh, the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now Khadija, because of the death of her two husbands, it appears that these marriages left her a very wealthy woman, especially the marriage of her second husband Atiq. Because they didn't have any children and Atiq apparently did not have any brothers. So when Atiq died, all of her money was then, in, all of his money was then inherited by Khadija. And we learn from this that Khadija became the wealthiest single lady in all of Mecca. She became the richest lady in all of Mecca. And on top of that, she is the daughter of the chieftain of the Banu Asad. And in those days, being the daughter of the chieftain and being wealthy, this meant everything. This is the most important thing for a marriage. And this made her, as Ibn Ishaq says, the most desirable lady of Mecca. She was the one that all of the suitors would be interested in, but she herself, after having been married twice, she did not apparently have, see any need to get married again until, as we will come to, uh, the Prophet wasallam. Now Khadija, as we said, had been left with a lot of money. And she is one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest lady of all of Mecca. And this also shows us that we know that Jahili society did not allow women to rise up. We know that Jahili society put women down. They had killed daughters at birth. They would not allow women to inherit the general rule. Nonetheless, once in a while, it would happen that a woman would inherit money, such as the case of Khadija. And so it's not as if it was a blanket rule that no woman could ever do anything. In the story of Khadija, we learn that even in Jahili society, women had a place and status, not anywhere close to what they had after Islam, but still Khadija is earning her own money, and she controls her money, and she is an independent lady. So there is some room for independence even in Jahili society. Uh, Khadija being a woman with a lot of money, actually had a negative side to that as well. And that, is, that was that people tried to swindle her and take advantage of her. How so? Because she cannot undertake business herself. It's a man's world out there. She cannot go to the marketplace and buy and sell. She cannot travel uh, like other people travel to go for, uh, for, for business. So what she would have to do is she would find a business manager who had to be a male. And this business manager, she would give him money, 10,000 gold coins here. You go and buy, let's say, uh, leather, or you buy spices, or you buy trade. And then you go sell it, let's say, in Syria. You will go sell it in Syria. And then you buy other goods from Syria, and then come back, and I will give you a percentage of this profit. Now, can you imagine in those days, there is no record keeping. These are all illiterate people. Uh, Khadija could not read or write as well. There's no, there's no computerized mechanized system of seeing what the inventory or stock is. It goes without saying, whoever she found turned out to be an evil person, a fraudster, a trickster who would take a large percentage. Many times Khadija would be left with hardly anything. Many times it would be a bare minimum of profit. And 
Khadija understood and realized that this was a very delicate situation to be in. How can she find it? If the man comes and says, oh, it was a very tough business here. I couldn't sell this item except for uh, 10, 10 gold coins and it's worth 50 gold coins. How does Khadija know what happens in Syria? How does Khadija know what is, if this man is pocketing 40 gold coins and giving her back only 10? Khadija has no way of finding out. And so for a number of years, Khadija kept on getting uh, swindled. She kept on getting, uh, if you like, shortchanged. And this was what led her to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did she find out about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Khadija has a sister and her sister was also called Hala. So her nephew, her, her son is called Hala and her sister is called Hala. There are some names in the Arabic language to this day, they apply to men and women. And so Hala is one of those names. So Hala has a, a uh, Khadija has a sister, her name is Hala. Hala owns some sheep. She owns some sheep. And in the course of finding a shepherd for her sheep, she f heard of the Prophet ﷺ. As you all know, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was a very young man, when he was a teenager, the very first job that he found was that of a shepherd. He would literally go and take uh, th these sheep, these goats, and he would go outside of the city of Mecca and find pasture for them and come back and he would be given copper coins, what we, what we now call pennies and cents. He would be given some copper coins. I mean, how much are you going to pay a shepherd? It's literally just walking out, finding grass and coming back. A lot of manual labor, but it doesn't require a skilled person to do it. But it does require a patient person. And the Prophet ﷺ learned to be patient by becoming a shepherd. And in one hadith he said, every single prophet whom Allah ever sent used to be a shepherd. Because being a shepherd teaches you to be patient, teaches you to take care of uh, the flock, it teaches you to, to look after each and every person in the community. And so the Prophet ﷺ became a shepherd for a number of years. During the course of being a shepherd, so Hala finds out that there is a person who is taking care of Sheep, and that's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so she negotiates with the Prophet sallallahu and he had a co-worker as well. We don't know his name. He had a co-worker. He had two people uh, that uh, that were working with him. Sorry, he had one person working with him. So they were a team of two people. If you like a little corporation, a little business of two people. So Hala agrees with these two people, one of whom is the Prophet sallallahu to go out with her. Uh, sheep and they do this for a number of times they they take out for a number of days a number of weeks until finally it time is come to pay them for their efforts so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told his companion he said to him uh, the companion said let us go collect our wages it's time for our paycheck to come the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said why don't you go and collect it on my behalf? I am shy to approach her. In other words, she's a woman and I don't want to approach her. Why don't you go and take my wages and then give it to me later on? So the man came alone to Hala. Hala said, where is your companion? In other words, I hired the two of you. I should pay you half and pay him half. So he said he was too shy to come and he instructed me to collect his wages and I will give it to him. At this, Hala said, I have never seen a more perfect gentleman and a more uh, modest and shy man than your companion, i.e. the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And it so happened that Khadija was sitting there at this time when this transaction is taking place. And that was the first time that she heard such noble praises of this human being, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the first time something entered her heart about uh, him. Slowly but surely the uh, word spreads that the Prophet ﷺ is a very trustworthy person. And he is, as you all know, he was called Al-Amin in Mecca. You all know this. And so the word spreads that he is a very honest person. And so Khadija sends a message to the Prophet ﷺ saying that, I have heard that you are a very honest man and I have a business proposal, a business transaction for you. Why don't you take my caravan to Syria and I shall give you one third of the profit. In other words, you just be the business manager. You be the business manager, you buy and sell, and you will get one third of the profit. Now imagine here the Prophet ﷺ is a shepherd, he's getting literally uh, pennies. This is now a business offer, maybe it's like $100,000, right? Imagine this is a, a massive difference. I mean, from, from being a shepherd to becoming a CEO of a company. That's literally the jump that, that he is being given. The Prophet ﷺ is so excited, he rushes home to Abu Talib, and he says, oh my uncle, 
so and so Khadija has given me a business uh, offer, do you think I should accept it or not? And Abu Talib tells him, of course my son, she is a noble lady and uh, inshallah ta'ala, you will get much money from this endeavor. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted uh, this offer and he took the caravan. According to one report, uh, Khadija also sent her personal uh, slave and servant Maysara as well with him and Maysara came back Firstly, the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, because not only was he the most honest and the most trustworthy, but also because of his manners and akhlaq, also because Allah blessed him, he made a huge profit, the likes of which no other uh, manager had ever made before. He made the largest profit that any manager had ever made before. Not only that, but because he's so honest, he comes and he gives Khadija, obviously, down to a penny, the full two-thirds, and he accepts the one-third. Right? So Khadija, maybe she's getting 5,000, 10,000 gold coins every year. Now she gets 80,000, 100,000 gold coins. She gets a massive amount of money. And Maysara comes back and he cannot stop talking about his companion, about the Prophet ﷺ. He cannot stop praising how gentle he was, how fair he was, how honest he was. And there are even reports that Maysara said that wherever he went, there was a cloud above him and this happened and that happened. So, so many reports. Now obviously Khadija is now uh, very much, if you like, uh, interested and, uh, uh, and there's no question, and some of you might feel um, strange for me to say this, but there's nothing at all to say that she had some feelings for our Prophet ﷺ. This is a part of being a human being, that it is natural to have uh, feelings for somebody else. It's natural to have uh, uh, attraction in such a scenario and situation. And there's nothing haram whatsoever. There's nothing makru whatsoever in speaking like this. Khadija obviously felt an inclination. She felt the beginnings of, 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 a, of, of a love for the Prophet ﷺ. And so she hinted to another servant of hers. And by the way, the very fact that she has so many servants that we read about clearly shows her status. She's not like an average lady. She has Maysara, she has Nafisa, uh, and that was her second servant, Nafisa. Uh, she also has uh, Zayd, who was to become uh, uh, the, the, the quote-unquote adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. This used to belong to Khadija. And when, uh, I'm jumping the gun here, but when she eventually married the Prophet ﷺ, one of the gifts she gave him was she gifted him Zayd as her slave as a, a strong man, Zayd, to be the personal assistant. And the first thing the Prophet did was he freed Zayd. He just made him a free man. Uh, and then eventually he adopted him, as you all know. And then Allah Azza wa Jal prohibited adoption, but he remained very close to the Prophet till his death. So much so, again, I'm jumping the gun here and going a different tangent. So much so, when Zayd's father came and Zayd's uncle came to try to collect Zayd because Zayd had been kidnapped as a child. Zayd had been kidnapped by a tribe and sold into slavery. He was not a slave by birth. He was a free man by birth. So when his father and uncle finally heard where Zayd is and they tracked him down to Mecca and they came back and they had a lot of money and they knocked on the door of the Prophet and they said, Zayd is our son and he was kidnapped and so on and so on and so forth. Here is this money. If you can sell him back to us, we will free him. The Prophet said, he's not a slave. He's a free man. It's up to him what he wants to do. And so Zayd comes out. He sees his father. He's emotional and whatnot. But then his father says, come back to me. And Zayd says, I'd rather stay with the Prophet ﷺ. And he voluntarily chose to not go back to his family and be in the household of the Prophet ﷺ. And that was when the Prophet ﷺ adopted him. When he gave up, if you like, going back to his family, the Prophet ﷺ adopted him. And then in Medina, Allah revealed, don't call them by your names, call them by their fathers. Uh, and so that adoption was repealed. I jumped the gun, let's get back to the story of Khadija. Khadija, where were we? So Khadija now sees the immense amount of... Uh, wealth and the honesty and the akhlaq and the blessings coming from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and like any shy woman she cannot obviously uh, propose directly but she hints some people some versions say it was a close friend other versions say it was a servant and her name was Nafisa uh, she hints to Nafisa that what a uh, handsome and young man this is and would it not be good if he found a, a good wife for him now obviously she is a single lady and she would not be speaking about a man unless she herself is interested so Khadija get, uh, Nafisa gets the point and so it is says that Nafisa uh, visited the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of course, this is before the time of any Islam, any laws of Islam. So there's no hijab. Women are visiting men. There's no issue uh, Islamically about that because Islam hasn't come yet. And so Nafisa visits the Prophet ﷺ and says, you are a, a young man. You should be looking for a wife. Why don't you find a wife? 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, who, who will possibly marry me? I'm a shepherd. I'm living in my uncle's house. To this point in time, the Prophet ﷺ did not even have his own apartment, his own.